All right, welcome everyone to the first day of our third annual Critical Access Hospital for Financial and Operational and Virtual Conference. We're excited to have everybody with us today. And um, so we're just gonna go over, we're gonna let a few more people, people are coming in, flooding in, and we will go ahead and get started with our first day of the and day one sessions. While people are trickling in, let me go ahead and go over a few housekeeping items. So participants are gonna be muted automatically. Please feel free to use the Q&A and the chat functions to share throughout the session. If there's something in particular that you that you like that you wanna have a takeaway. If you have questions, if you have questions from previous sessions, feel free to be able to put them in. All the sessions are being recorded. And so the slides and the recordings are gonna be made available to all the registrants following the webinar. So that um, that will be available to all of you, especially since some of these sessions are like our first one today are designed more as a conversation with um, our friends at Mount Graham. So you will make sure that you will have those recordings since the recordings will be really valuable. We do appreciate this is our third annual conference and the feedback that people have provided each year has been really helpful for us to improve this conference each year. Make sure everybody has access to the kind of information and sessions that they want to have. So please make sure you take time to be able to fill out that survey. We very much appreciate it. And it has made this conference grow bigger and better every single year, helping more and more rural hospitals throughout the country. A little bit for those of you who are not familiar with us at Stroudwater. Stroudwater was established in 1985. We've been around for 38 years, serving rural communities throughout the country. As you can see from our map, we service clients in all 50 states. As a firm, we are the preeminent firm across the country that is focused on rural community hospitals and health systems that have a large impact on rural. Rural has is under-resourced, it has loads of talent, and it has really technical rules that impact how we need to be able to do business and make sure we pre preserve access and enhance access to care for our communities. So we are happy to be focused on the community that we're talking to today. You guys are who we are and we love serving you. Um, since 2020, we actually also, as part of that um, mission, we have actually expanded to add Stroudwater Capital Partners that we're very excited to have within house now to get make sure that they are able to help all of you find access to capital. So they've been very busy these past few years helping people across the country find access to capital for their different capital needs and doing partnerships with USDA and other lending programs to make sure that rural communities can get access to the money that they need to continue to provide those services, very aligned in our visions. As a company, we are a full service consulting shop. We do strategic, operational, and financial um, consulting services across all the different spectrums of from a provider perspective. So anything that your rural hospital, your clinic, your outpatient services, revenue cycle, population health, partnerships, et cetera, we are here to help you with that and making sure that you guys are really strong now and going into the future with the resources that you have. So we're excited to bring the session with you today. And we're gonna start off with actually talking about medical staff development plans and a project that we did with our good friends at Mount Graham Regional Medical Center. We are joined today by Roland Knox, who is the CEO of Mount Graham, who we've been working with. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off with my colleague, Claire Kelly, and we're gonna have a little chat with Roland today. So, Get it, um, starting off, okay, here's our contact information of those of us who were um, on the project. I'm Opal Greenway, principal at Stroudwater. I lead our physician advisory group. Claire Kelly works closely with me on anything provider strategy and medical staff development plans. And then with Roland, who has been the CEO of Mount Graham Regional Medical Center that is located in Safford, Arizona. It's a new critical access hospital. It's been a hospital for a number of years, but it's new to being part of the critical access hospital family. And prior to being CEO at Mount Graham, he has actually also served as the CFO and the COO as well. And has been, was also previously the CEO of Northern, um, I'm gonna mispronounce this role in Cochise Community Hospital in Cochise. Wilcox. Cochise, I'm just sad because I've spent time in Wilcox, Arizona. It's a lovely area. So thank you, Roland, again for joining us today. And why don't you tell so let's kick off with, why don't you tell us a little bit about Mount Graham Regional Medical Center and you know, joining being a CAW and you know how we met. Very good, thank you, Opal. Appreciate it, and thank you, Claire. I want to thank both of you up front for the work you've been helping our organization with, and 
Um, I'll tell you a little bit about our organization. We are right now a 25 bed critical access hospital. We also have 10 observation beds that we have in our facility, which also helps us meet the needs of the community. We've been serving the community. This is our 50th anniversary. So we're in the process of celebrating that. Yeah, it is, it's neat. So it's really been fun going back and looking at our history and how we got started with the donation of land that we're still on today, a number of acres that we're on. We provide a lot of services, specialty services from general surgery, orthopedic, OBGYN, GI, um, pain management, podiatry, the list goes on. So through the years, we've had an incredible board that's helped us grow. That uh, outpatient, of course, is 75% of our business and we continue to grow that sector of our business. Now, thank you for that background, Roland. Um, it's, it's a great community. I will say I'm biased because I have a lot of family in Arizona. And so, so glad that um, hospitals like you are there to help service it. So, Roland, why don't you talk just a little bit? I know when we first met and we were talking, we got introduced um, through, I actually don't remember exactly how we got introduced. I think it might, Jill Bullock from the state office um, helped a little bit with that. But I know you guys were looking at, per, you were evaluating potentially a purchase of a practice and we had a conversation expanded you know, beyond, hey, should we just look at whether or not we want to purchase an OBGYN practice? And in our conversations that evolved into looking at a much bigger picture with regards to your providers. So talk to us a little bit about what you got, you know, the thought process there and why you guys decided to, instead of just let's take a look at an OBGYN practice, why don't we look at our providers more holistically? Yeah, thank you for that, uh, leading into that. So it really started in 2021 when we were looking at, um, we were all in the midst of COVID and we're looking at how do we see through this fog so that when we come out of this fog of uh, COVID, we have a set plan in place. And so we hired Adam Strom, who is also with Stroudwater to help us with a uh, strategic plan. And we put together that strategic plan during 2021. He introduced me to another presenter, which is Opal Greenway. And she was talking and I attended that. And so connected the two of them in 2022, when we were looking at how do we implement our strategic plan, 13 initiatives with the first one being, let's expand what we currently provide and make it better, but also look to see how do we preserve those practices in our community where the providers are getting close to maybe eight to 10 years, maybe three years to retirement? How do we ensure that those practices continue and how do we recruit? And so that tied the two of them together. And that's how we, um, when we started talking with Opal about and Claire about developing our medical staff development plan, but you're right, it started with the initiation of a conversation with uh, an existing OBGYN practice who came to us and said, can you help us recruit? We really don't have the wherewithal to do this. So we started talking with him and the more we understood and really knew he fit into that parameter we're looking at is he's probably gonna retire in three to six years. And so how do we ensure that that's practice stays open and that we continue to expand that we just laid it on the table and said, during this conversation, if you would like to have uh, us consider buying your practice, let's have that conversation. And then as we started more and more and they thought about it, he and his wife, who was the practice manager, brought together to us. And then that's really when we thought, okay, it's nice to have these thoughts as to what you want to do, but a written document really is, an, is a document you can re refer to when you kind of lose track of, okay, what's next? And so our strategic plan was that document and it aligned so closely to the thought of having a medical staff development plan. So now we have written documents that we can continue to look, look at and help guide us. Yeah, fantastic. I know it, it was such a, it was a great way to be thinking about it instead of just, hey, there's a practice that wants to be purchased. Okay, let's purchase it, right? That's what we, that's yeah. what we typically see. And so to have, you know, the insight of saying, wait a minute, what's our strategy? What should we look? So I remember we sat down, we crafted, you know, Broadwater does this work of putting together medical staff development plans. But I remember us actually having really good conversations going back and forth of really doing what we do of tailoring it to what do you guys specifically need instead of just here's a cookie cutter, we're going to fill out this template and a report and send it back to you. 
you know, thinking back and forth and um, and reaching out to Jill at the state to actually, I will say, pro tip for any CEOs out there, B. Roland, who, can, who called up his state office and said, can you help fund this for us, right? Your state offices always want to help you. And so if there's um, if there's stuff that you want to do, the state, you know, always have that conversation with your state to see, can you help fund this project for us? Because um, pro move on Roland's part to make sure that it was um, it was a joint um, effort between uh, Mount Graham and the state to be able to put this together. So we put together that scope of putting together a full blown medical staff development plan for you. Um, so it was it was a great thing to scope out. Um, yeah. And curious, you know, in terms of involvement from your medical staff, talk to us about how you involved your, your medical staff in this process and what their reaction was to the process. Yeah, thanks, Claire. It was really good. You were a vital part of that. You helped come in with Zoom meetings and we held lunch meetings with our medical staff. We also had um, conversations with our internal employees, our board of directors, but with the medical staff, we kind of, we had already established a pattern and practice of how we communicate at, at Mount Graham, which is that we're open with whatever we're doing. Our medical staff, our goal is that they never come to us and say, nobody told me, or I'm surprised about this. That is our goal. That's what we developed as we did our strategic plan. So we followed the same pattern of inviting them in, um, socializing it first initially with the MEC, and the other committees with the medical staff, but then moving step forward, further with that is connecting with each one of the clinics in the community, each one of the providers on a personal basis and saying, we're looking at doing this. Their reaction immediately was, well, wait a minute, who's it gonna hurt? Who's gonna be hurt by this? And our response was, that's why we need your involvement. We, our intent is not to hurt anyone, to not step on any toes, let's do this together and figure out what you want to recruit, what we want to recruit, and then move forward with it. So yeah, we engaged the medical staff from day one. Yeah, I will say, Roland, you very much took, um, as an organization, but you with your CEO leadership really took an abundance mindset of, we need to do what's right for the community. And we don't have to be all things to all people. We have to make sure that the community is served. So let's involve independent providers in this conversation. The fact that it wasn't just, okay, what's best for Mount Graham? It was what's best for this overall community. And how do we, you know, how do we fully provide that so that nobody was hurt, et cetera, and that it wasn't just the full responsibility, but you really initiated that mentality across the community and demonstrated that leadership. That's something that I have to say, not every organization has had that relationship historically with their medical staff, um, even though both the independents or even with the employed where they're some organizations we run into, they're more used to a top-down, here's what it's going to be. And um, based off of what our experience with you, I will say having the medical staff involved, it's such a much more successful project than and, and a result that you guys can really do something with than when somebody asks us, can you just go crunch some numbers and tell me how many people I need to recruit? Um, because we were, I, you guys were, far better actually about knowing some of the numbers because of that relationship for your independence. A lot of times we do run into situations where people are like, oh, well, I know we have these doctors in the community, but I have no idea how much they work. Like, I don't know if they're one day a week, five days a week, et cetera, who's visiting, who's not. And we, you know, that can result in some duplicate um, or actually insufficient recruitment that happens when people are like, they think that a provider's full-time, but they actually only work, you know, they're cutting back to a day and a half a week. And so now we're, we're short and we don't have enough access to primary care is a, is a big one that we see on a regular basis. Yeah. Our medical staff was very forthright too, as to here's the priorities we have. And some of them were ones that were unrealistic for us because we just knew how hard they were to recruit like a pulmonologist or a neurologist or a full-time cardiologist. Those are all things that are on our list and they'll be on there till we can fill them. But they also understood that, but I think some of that was the testing of, okay, how serious are you about this? And then, you know, they've helped us in the last, uh, since 2022, when you guys started helping us, we've recruited um, more than 10 physicians and uh, uh, three, excuse me, five, um, allied health professionals. So we've had success, but it's because when we recruit, we engage the medical staff to be part of that recruitment 
um, conversation, and that also has been very helpful with it. Well, since you already did the lead-in role, and I'm going to go ahead and ask you that question of, all right, so you know, you you have this medical staff development plan. What have you done with it? It sounds like you've been busy. <laughs> well, you and I talked uh, before this a couple of months ago, and I jokingly said we haven't even taken it off the shelf. But the reality is, <laughs> it in our strategic plan or our guide that we talk about all the time at our organization and how we're moving forward with it. And that's what it was really nice to have, the, again, that written document that we all are, all of us in the rural healthcare, we wear many hats and we have a lot of things on our mind and we have to think about a lot of things and all of us are strategists in our own way. But to have that document where you could go back and say, okay, what did we think we needed and how are we approaching that? But then also with this plan that we had was about, What's your timeline? How are you putting your business plan together? Have you thought about the staffing? Have you thought about your budget? Does it fit within your budget? Is it going to cash flow? All of those details that you know it when it's said to you, but to have that reference document, that's really been critical for us as we've moved forward. What do you, I'm curious, Roland, what do you think has been the most valuable component of the medical staff development plan for you? Yeah, just what I said just now is, is having that document to reference. You know, two of the comments that we had from our medic, from our board of directors when we kept them involved in this conversation is, is that the things that they asked us, if we're spending money on these types of plans, don't leave them on the shelf. And so that's really been a mantra for us is that you have a plan, use the plan. And that's really what we've done. And so that to me has been the most valuable is to have that plan and then compare it continuously with our strategic plan. We have a dashboard for our strategic plan and the very first initiative is continuing to buy practices and to continue to recruit. So it's outlined, this is what we're doing. This is our timeline. It's been in the budget. This is when we anticipate having them here. And this is how it's going to help us as a community, but also financially as an organization. So the most value is it's a written document to reference. Now, Roland, you did bring up something about, you know, your your annual planning and like, can you, um, you know, can you afford things, et cetera? And we recognize that recruitment doesn't always go on our schedule, right? Sometimes it takes longer or faster or somebody becomes available. Talk about to us a little bit about, um, and especially because working with you and I know people are seeing Eric Shell, but Roland has his own Eric, um, who is incredibly helpful. You know, I, I remember um, rural, we're short research, like we don't have enough resources. We all know that. And so the people who are executing this plan, I mean, you guys are looking at him <laughs> as far as who's doing it. He didn't hand the report off to somebody else. So you and Eric have had to do so much of the actual recruitment, you know, how like your actual annual goals for recruitment each year, how are you guys balancing that with the um, with the resources that you have of having that written document now about who does what and, and being able to plan your resource utilization? Yeah. So again, you helped us didn't even know it as to you expressing that to Eric and I is, look, you guys got a lot on your plate. Can you do it? That made us pause and say, okay, what do we need? So we put together a team. This is our business purchase or a recruitment analysis team. And we built a team of five to seven people. We didn't want it any more than that, which included, of course, finance and HR. Then we put together a physician recruitment team. So we built teams based on our knowledge of seeing a plan and writing as to what the details were that it's not possible for one person. And it was a very enriching to all of us that we asked people to be part of it and they were so excited because they had not been asked to be part of it before and so our hr team you know our it team um you go right down the list our plant services team all of them have been involved in our planning process so now not eric and i we don't have to carry all that weight we have others that are helping us that i think is the success as to why we've been able to bring on more than one doctor at a time. But what we've also been by having the written document is we saw on our list, we want to recruit a gastroenterologist. We hope to have those conversations in 2023. 2024 will probably be where we're going to really be able to recruit one. But just having that awareness 
one came available and we were prepared with our analysis and what we knew we could do and we were able to act quicker than others that were being that were recruiting this gastroenterologist so again that written document to be able to reference it was the key for us to be able to act yeah, that's really awesome to be able to look a year ahead and say, hey, you know, are, are my plan is to go like do this ne next year, but knowing, hey, I like the, I think about how we started out with the OBGYN conversation, you know, you need one, you know, yeah. and it might not be until next, you know, your plan wasn't for another year, but somebody became available and you know that, hey, the business plan that I wasn't planning on executing until next year, but it's available this year. You know, why not? I already know that I, I need it. I already know that I've already done all of my, you know, due diligence about can I afford it? Can I, you know, am I going to be able to keep one busy, et cetera, is it's definitely important to have at your fingertips so you can at, move quickly because somebody else will otherwise. Yes. Yeah. One of one of our favorite sayings here is time is never a neutral factor and how important it is to be efficient with your with your time and your decision making. With that yeah. being said, Roland, we've talked a lot about recruitment. What about, you know, the recommendations around retention and alignment of your providers? How has that been going in terms of, you know, some of the goals that we set around that? Yeah, that's that's a really good question because, right, it's the recruiting part, but then also to continue to assure those that you bring on to your organization, that they're part of the organization, how they're contributing it to it, acknowledging it, and connecting them with others in the community of physicians in the community in general, so that they do want to stay and be part of us. The retention part is also just the inclusion of the medical staff. I think that that's a really big piece that does more for retention than we realize. And we've really seen it with our recruitment committee and with sharing with the medical staff, making them part of it, they then help when the physicians show up, not only during the recruitment process, but also to start doing work with us. I need to share real quickly, one, two of our successes, one with the OBGYN, who we just got a returned uh, signed offer letter this morning. Um, and the, yes, another one. Uh, and then a gastroenterologist, we had our opens, openings and so we determined we can't let these stay open let's bring them on as a locum for a period of time and then one of our people in our recruitment committee said well they're locum and if they like us why don't we offer them a job and a lot of us who've been around thought nah locums don't aren't that thought process so happens that these two both of them said wow I would love to be here. I love this environment. This was a real nice trial run that you gave me for two months or 10 days or whatever it was. I would love to entertain the idea of coming full time. So again, just this whole concept of being aware of opportunity because you've thought about it before it happens or comes to you has really been very, very helpful to us. Oh, that's Fantastic. I love it when I see the providers who are already like, hey, why not, you know, and, and, and seeing that kind of success, they're going to look for more opportunities, right? They're going to be thinking about, all right, what's the next one? Let's, hey, you know, hey, Roland, pull out a you know, committee, pull out that plan again. Like what, what's coming down the pipeline? What, what's, you know, what does year four look like? What does year five look like? Are there, you know, do I know anybody who meets these kinds of criteria that I would want to work with, et cetera? Um, so, you know, that's, that's really exciting to be able to engage your medical staff that way. It's such a good way of actually improving, you know, as you said, it's going to, you know, unexpected improvement from retention, you know, that, I mean, we know that was a goal and we identified who were the providers that, you know, we, we identified people who might be high risk, et cetera, that you needed to make sure you made those efforts around, but also the unexpected retention that comes from even just better provider engagement. Um, that you had already had good history of, but how you can always be improving on that. Um, one thing with regards to recruitment and retention that like bringing on and adding practices that are now, that might've been independent, but already in the community, um, but are now under your wing. I remember specifically, we talked about, you guys had some strategy initiatives around communication and making sure the community understood who, who you had, the providers, et cetera. Talk to us, how's that been going? It's been going very well. We've been very proactive with it and we highlight one or two providers every single month in our 
uh, communications that we have and we layer that. We do the social media, we do paper, um, we do communication um, in meetings, what we go out in the community and we have informational sessions with them to tell them about, you asked us to recruit this. Here, we, this is what we've done. We wanna follow up. Again, that was part of our strategic plan is to follow up and our commitment to the community was, we'll tell you how we're advancing on the strategic plan and also where we're not doing quite as well as we'd want to. The recruitment side of it and the growth of the practice has really, of the organization has really been fortunate for us. We, things have just aligned. But I want to pause just a minute. The way that they aligned started many years ago. What I mean by that is that we've had a board of directors that has really been supportive of the organization and have known that at some point in time, we have to reach outside of ourselves, meaning that we can't just be happy with what we're doing. You have to have an offensive, meaning that we are a small independent hospital. We do not want to be part of the system. You either become part of a system so you can have all these other specialists or you build your own system within yourself and provide to your community and look at providing care outside of your campus. And our board has been very, very supportive of that. So when we come to them with, oh, now we wanna do this, the first thing they ask us, when are we gonna see the business plan? So they know that that's the process and they're able to articulate to us very early, we're very supportive of it, continue, make sure you keep us in the loop. So part of all of this has to be acknowledgement that the organization was poised it just needed the right prompting and preparation. And with the strategic plan, the medical staff development plan, knowing that our actions were thought through beforehand, the board has been so supportive of it. That's awesome. Well, um, so a question has come in and a question says, so the, the understanding, and I'm gonna answer part of the question is, it, is, it was a five-year medical, because it was asking how long, long does this go out? Um, it was a five-year medical staff development plan. When, like, how frequently do you think you're going to need to update it, or um, you know, when do you need to update it? When is it irrelevant? Well, um, right now we still have a couple of providers that we have not been able to, um, but we've had so many that have moved off of year one and two, and some are in three. That now is the time. Um, right now we're focused. Uh, we hired. Opal and Claire to help us with another project, which is with all these new providers, we have to have a structured uh, uh, program, payment program for them and a reimbursement so that we're in compliance, but also there's consistency when we recruit a doc or an allied health professional that we're not just guessing, oh, let's reimburse them this way. And this is our fair market value and this is how we are. So, um, that's where we're moving forward to is, is the next step is to have that put in place once we have that in place. So to answer your question very directly, 2024 is when we're going to look at our medical staff development plan again. Okay, well, good, good to know. And especially, I mean, just to let everybody know what Roland was referencing is, yeah, um, we wasn't planning on talking about it today, but yeah, we're doing a compensation strategy engagement together because one of the important things that I would say is the best practice in a medical staff development plan is not just how many providers does your community need, but a key component of having retention of providers is can they be compensated the way that they want to be? So you have to always be able to adjust certain ratios for, well, how do you pay them? So if they, if there you have providers who want to be making at the 75th percentile, you need to take that into consideration, the medical staff development plan, because if you start recruit, if you recruit another provider, when the whole market can only support one and a half people, they might not be able to make what they want to and stay in that community. And then you end up having to recruit all over again because, you know, there were different expectations. And so having that financial plan that takes into consideration, realistically, what we know, it's not just here's what a population ratio needs, which would be more of just a provider needs analysis. But how are you going to keep them busy enough with, you know, what, what are their expectations? Are you recruiting a family med provider who wants to see, do a lot of Medicare wellness visits and wants to see only 10 patients a day, um, you know, because they like to get, they want to get, do a lot of chronic care management? Or do you want to have somebody 
you need somebody who's going to see 25 patients a day. If you're not transparent about that, you're going to have a rotating door of um, providers. So um, I know I want to be respectful of um, our next presenter, Eric Schell. So thank you, Roland, so much for joining us today um, and kicking up such a good kickoff and topic for people to start off um, our session. And with that, I will go ahead and if Thanks, you have Roland. additional questions. Thanks, yes, thank you. If you have Thank additional you. questions that we can address, um, please put them in the chat. We will make sure that they're sent out with the recording, any of the different questions that you have. But with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Eric Schell, who's going to be talking about organizational values. Thanks, Opal. Let me, uh, we're just gonna take two seconds here and uh, turn the technology over. over. Yep. Uh, hold on a second. <clears throat> this is the first time I've used Zoom. Um, since the pandemic. So <laughs> let's see here, share screen. How's that look for everybody? Looks, Looks great, Eric. Eric. Okay, great. Uh, well, well, um, yeah. Again, I I echo the thanks for everyone participating, and it's uh, you know good good uh, afternoon to many of you, and to the friends coming in from Hawaii. Good morning to you. Um, the um, you, you know the the source of this presentation is really questions. You know, I've been traveling around rural America for twenty six years now, and probably visited three hundred rural hospitals, and. So people will ask me, you know, what are the keys to success? What do you consider if you distill it down to just a couple, two or three, um, you know, kind of attributes of successful critical access hospitals? What are they? And you know, it's taken me a while to think about them. And you know, I I, I think I have them right. Maybe the presentation format isn't just perfect, but I do think that that these three attributes that we're going to talk about are are literally the keys to the kingdom. And so, so, so with that as an introduction, I, I'd like to kick this thing off. So for those of you who don't know me, Eric Shell, I'm a principal chairman of Strawwater Associates and um, have been working a CPA MBA by training and um, ha have traveled around the world, uh, met many of you and um, like to continue to do so for the next 26 years. So um, anyway, uh, I know uh, my colleagues just grimaced. So, so let's kick this off. I'm gonna tip my hand a little bit here and, 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 and say, okay, what are these attributes of the most successful critical access hospitals? And, and, I, and I put them into three, uh, three buckets and, and we're gonna get into each one of these buckets. Uh, the first is an abundance mindset. And we'll talk a little bit about what an abundance mindset is. The second is a fundamental understanding of economics in what drives financial improvement. And, and you know, understanding the difference between fixed and variable costs and how to think about volume, both fee-for-service and health-related volume um, at, from an economic perspective. And the third key to the kingdom is a measurement culture and you know, to, to, you know, creating the cultures of accountability through measurement. And, and those are the three, uh, again, you, know, you take everything that I've done, all my travels, and it comes back to those three things over and over and over again. And, and, um, um, and then I'm gonna just show some case studies about, about um, uh, you, you know, to demonstrate some of these with, with several rural hospitals that went from not being very successful to being incredibly successful with an adoption of some of these principles. So, um, and I'm going to try to get all of this done in, 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 in 28 minutes. So we'll see how we do. I, I like to start with this slide because, um, you know, one, this is the values of Stroudwater Associates and, and um, you know, kind of impact, you know, you, you know, get up every morning, want to make a difference in this world. Uh, interdependence, recognizing that we are all just a small cog. We're all interconnected. And having that recognition, um, you know, you, you know, really helps when we think about um, organization strategies, individuals, et cetera. Respect, and you know, and and, and it's a whole, it's a more of a wholesome respect, starting with yourself, your environment, uh, others, and and and. But the final one, and this is the one that I, you know, kind of uh, is to me the number one keys to kingdom is an abundance mindset. And if, if, if you allow me, I'm going to pull up on my cell phone, um, Stephen Covey, and I'm going to read pages uh, 219 and the top of page 220 
from the 35 or 40 year old book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, right? Um, from Stephen Covey. Uh, uh, you know, the, so I, I just want to read a little bit about, and, and when I talk about abundance, I'm comparing it to scarcity. And so let me let me just read it's six paragraphs. So so be patient, hang in there. Um, and, and what he talks about is the, the, the third character trait essential to the win-win is the abundance mentality, the paradigm that there's plenty out there for everyone. Here, here's the, the challenge. Most people, and I would say 80% of, of, of executives in all organizations um, are deeply scripted in what I call the scarcity mentality. They see life as having only so much as though there was only one pie out there, as if someone were to get a big piece of the pie, it would mean less for everybody else, primarily less for me. Um, people with a scarcity mentality have a very difficult time sharing recognition and credit, power or profit, even with those who help in the production. They also have a very hard time being genuinely happy for the successes of other people, even sometimes, especially members of their own family or close friends and associates. It's almost if something is being taken from them when someone else receives special recognition. They might verbally express happiness for others' success. Inwardly, they are eating their hearts out. Um, only so many people can be A students. Only one person can be number one. To win simply means to beat. Um, people, Often people with scarcity mentality harbor secret hopes that others might suffer misfortune. Not terrible misfortune, but acceptable misfortune that would keep them in their place. They're always comparing, always competing. Um, it's difficult for people with scarcity mentality to be members of a complementary team. They look on differences as signs of insubordination and disloyalty. And now that's all about scarcity. There's one paragraph on abundance. And essentially, it's 180 degrees from what we just talked about. It says, abundance mentality, on the other hand, flows out. Um, uh, let me, uh, I got to... <laughs> Uh, get on here. Out of a deeper sense of personal worth and security, it is the paradigm that there is plenty out there and enough to spare for everybody. It results in sharing of prestige, of recognition, of profits, of decision making. It opens possibilities, options, alternatives, and creativity. That is the essence of abundance. So, and when when you run into rural hospital, critical access hospital leaders that are abundance minded. You you immediately see success and and um, you know and it's interesting because I'm going to get into some case studies and every one of the case studies um, the, the the challenge with being in abundance is abundance is you're looking out for others you're looking out to take care of others and you've got your back wide open where scarcity you're taking care of yourself and and often abundance gets taken out in the case studies I'm going to share with you. Every single one of the CEOs of those organizations was either put in their place or taken out at some point. Um, um, two of which then were, re, you know, were brought back in the organization when the organization started to struggle. And so again, you know, abundance—it's a difficult. It's 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 difficult because you're going to be under attack, but at the same time, it's the right thing to do. So strategy number one: an abundance mindset. The second is an economic under, firm understanding of economics and what drives profit within organizations. And, and I know you're thinking, oh gosh, Eric, this sounds so mundane, yet yeah, we all know that. Well, here's the challenge is that, um, first of all, let me explain, contribution margin is the keys to the kingdom. And contribution margin is, a, is essentially, it's a formula that's it's revenue, uh, revenue um, per unit of service, per department, per hospital, less variable expenses of whatever's being provided. And, and um, you, know, it, you know, think about the variable expenses in a rural hospital, you know, very expenses that vary with changes in volume. If you close your eyes, but not too long, and think about true expenses that vary with changes in volume, specific changes in volume, they're minuscule. They're pennies on the dollar. One more CT scan today from the six that you're already doing today really costs nothing, but the revenue is substantial. And, and so having that understanding of contribution margin is so critical. The problem with, with contribution margin is there's not an accounting system in the world that will define for you a variable cost. 
And now you're scratching your head saying, what are you talking about, Eric? My accounting systems will do that. I've got cost accounting systems, a step down costs, et cetera, et cetera. And that gives you the wrong answer most of the time because the accounting systems don't understand the time frame for decision making. For example, if you're making a spot market decision today, if I'm going to admit a patient or not, the variable cost of your sixth patient of the day versus your fifth is essentially food, some pharmaceuticals. You're not going to change your staffing model. You're not going to change the CEO's compensation or the CFO's compensation, the depre depreciation of the facility. And so a tiny, tiny bit of that, that additional um, admission today is a variable expense. But over a five-year planning period, 100% of variable, right? If the hospital is losing money, it closes. So 100. So, so, and then on the midterm, if you want to look, for example, you know, is lab as a department, you know, a six to 12-month planning horizon, all of a sudden now staffing becomes part of the variable cost. And so it's really important to understand this economic uh, you know, philosophy that incremental volume results, you know, um, you know, incremental volume over which you currently have has tiny variable costs, creates significant contribution margin. And the goal of a rural hospital at a critical access hospital is to create thousands and thousands of units of, contribu of, 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 of many contribution margins. So, so again, you know, just, just a you quick highlight, um, you know, this is, I'm going to show you, so volume goes along the x-axis, dollars are on the y-axis, and if we just look at costs, we have high fixed costs. So what that means is that no patient volume, your, stat, your costs start way up the, 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 um, the y-axis, and think about that as your employee parking lot at 8 o'clock in the morning versus your patient parking lot at 8 o'clock in the morning. That's high fixed costs. Um, and then for every incremental unit of service, our costs go up a tiny bit. They go up just a small bit. So you have a very flat curved cost curve. On the revenue side, on the other hand, you have a very steep slope. You generate one additional patient day and that patient day drops $2,500 to your bottom line in terms of new revenue. So you have a very steep slope curve here. What this points out is the keys to the, is, is, is is an important key to success is pushing out patient volume, um, where you, ultimately the the revenue curve being steeper than the, the the flat cost curve is going to catch up and surpass, creating this zone of profit. Um, and you know just just to show highlight what that looks like from a graph. This is just looking at a spreadsheet that I created to say, okay, let's look at a fixed let's look at a, a inpatient unit in which fixed costs are six million. And, and variable costs are uh, uh, $250 a day for, for acute and $150 a day for swing bed. And you can see as you vary volume from a census of four each to a census of nine each, your costs, the variable, excuse me, the fixed costs remain fixed and the variable costs go up a tiny bit. Now play that out for a critical access hospital. What results from a unit cost basis as you push out volume, your the 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 um the maroon color is your fixed cost per unit of service. Your variable cost per unit of service remains constant, but your overall total costs come down as you dilute fixed costs over more and more units of service. That's why when I hear people talk is you know critical acts hospitals, hey, you know, how do we get our per diems? You know, my next door neighbor's got a per diem of 2,500, I'm 1,800. How do we get our per diem up to 2,500? And the answer is you don't, because that means your costs are, are, are 2,500. And this all plays out here. This, this, this graph right here um, really shows how to be successful as a critical access hospital in three easy steps. And let me explain it. So this is your revenue curve. Uh, this is your, your non-cost-based payment for Blue Cross for an inpatient day or any Medicaid, self-pay. It's a flat line. It's not tied to cost. The, the, um, the pink line is your cost per unit of service. As volume goes up, your costs go down. And then your, 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 um, the, the, the red line is your Medicare revenue. It's essentially your cost plus 1%. And I would argue it's probably less than that with sequestration. Uh, but so when you look at this unit, this inpatient unit for a critical access hospital, the break-even point is right here. But, but the break-even point is when you cost, you, you push volume out to the point where your unit costs fall below your revenue curve for your non-cost-based payers. 
What this points to is there's three keys to success within critical access hospitals. You can either cut expenses, which is challenged because in, in, you know, in all my 300 hospitals that I've helped, probably we've only recommended cutting costs three or four times because you all have figured that out and often cutting into the bone. You can push out revenue to drive unit, your dilution of unit costs so you can be profitable, or you can negotiate higher prices with Blue Cross and, and, and all of your uh, commercial plans. Not necessarily an easy choice. So the primary option you have is to figure out how to keep volume in your community. And when you know 65% of your volume is driving right by the front door of your hospital, there is always an opportunity within rural. And so how do we think about that? Um, you know, you know, really efficient is going to be appropriate patient volumes meeting the needs of their service area. If there's an opportunity to increase your market share from 30% to 35%, that's a 15% increase in volume. And that is a volume that dilutes your unit costs and allows and creates profitability. Your revenue cycles operating at best practices. Physician practices are managed aggressively. Um, effective organizational design. We'll talk about that. And so what are specific things that we can do around, um, you know, kind of, um, you know, volume and payment? I always use the analogy of there's, there's, there's pitcher department managers and there's catcher department managers. Uh, the catcher sits behind the office, uh, in their office, and, 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 and the ball comes in and it's either a ball or a strike and they point to the pitcher and say, it's your fault. Um, and, and so what happens is, is, is there's not a lot of proactivity, no entrepreneurship, um, and, and where the, the pitcher, and there's always one pitcher in every organization from a departmental manager perspective, they're out there at the high school football games, they're out there in the health fairs, they've got Facebook posts about services they're providing, they're staying open at night past, you know, five o'clock to see a patient that can't get in until six o'clock. Those are, and generally that one department, you're seeing growth in volume. And often the big opportunities when we've shined lights is ER admissions, swing bed, ancillary services. Um, um, so, so, so that, that's I just really wanted to focus on that to tie into that you know that fundamental understanding of economic and the need to grow out uh, services. Um, the the next area I just want to touch on is a measurement culture. Right, so we've got an abundance, we've got an economic philosophy that leads to driving patient volume, increasing patient volume by maintaining market share. Both abundance and the market share play are, are absolutely connected. But now what we have to think about is organizational design. And think of organizational design as a three-legged stool of where we set decision rights, how we measure performance, and how we set compensation. Economic theory, or excuse me, organizational theory says that in organizations that want to push down decision rights into the bowels of an organization, if you're going to if you're going to decentralize decision rights, we have to create more measurement, both from a management perspective at the highest level and then a management level, so those decision makers can evaluate the impact of decisions that they're making. And the third leg of the stool, if we do push down decision rights, if we do create more measurement then we want to tweak compensation to recognize merit. And often I'm, I'm, I'm at hospitals, I was at a hospital yesterday that the whole entire system um, has no merit pay. And, and that frustrates me. Um, but then I'm sure we could all get into a big uh, debate on that. So what are opportunities around a measurement culture, right? The first and foremost is management accounting. Um, I look at a best practice, and there's a lot of words here, but I look at a best practice from a management accounting perspective is that if managers are engaged in their budget, both volume and expense on the front end. I was at a hospital a couple months ago where the CFO said managers have no influence over their volume. We don't, we only ask them to, you know, to, to create budgets for expenses. And in organizations like that, you've got two, you got, you, you essentially, you got the CEO responsible for volume. I like to see managers engaged in buy-in to the upfront volume as part of the budget process. Then going forward, monthly financial statements with required variance analysis. And, and you know, this is, these are just examples here of, 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 of how hospitals, you know, the, the you know, words around what I just said there. But um, if you aren't doing that now, if you know the hospital I was at yesterday, they do a great job of, of engaging department managers in the budget, both volume and expense. 
But then during the year, they don't send out any information to the managers to look at how they're doing the year. Great upfront, but they failed. And then I like to see quarterly departmental operational reviews where the CEO and CFO can coach managers on, on how to be business leaders. And, and so, you know, management accounting, staffing efficiencies, you know, measurement culture. What does your staffing look like? Um, Stroudwater has developed a set. These are, I'm going to highlight there. These are hourly standards that we like to look at um, on a paid hour basis, not worked, but paid. So for, for example, med search, this hospital had volume of 4,500 days. We look at 12, um, uh, 12 paid hours as the standard for, uh, uh, you know, a patient day. The standard we resolved here, the hospital was staffed a little heavy here. The good news there is they have room for additional growth. And every department, the ER is another one we like to look at. ER, we look at 2.75 paid hours per emergency room visit. This hospital is staffed a little high here. Good news is they have room for growth. Rarely, rarely, like I said, only three or four times, maybe five times in all my travels that we recommended cutting staff. But we said that there's opportunities for growth with current staffing levels. Staffing bench, uh, you know, your, your, uh, excuse me, um, provider, uh, um, you know, here's another opportunity, looking at your providers relative to population demand. Um, Stroudwater, you know, based on some studies that have been done over the last 20 years, what studies have said is that, for example, um, you know, given a population of 23,600, we would expect to see somewhere between 15.8 and 15.7 and 21 primary care providers. This community had 11.5. They were woefully short on primary care, which means either the primary care physicians are super busy or people are leaving town for basic primary care, something that we really try to uh, avoid in our rural hospitals. So just, just a couple case studies before we wrap up, because I, I want to, you know, <laughs> keep the, the trains on time here. Um, as I mentioned, I think I have three or four case studies. Um, the first one, this is a critical access hospital in the Northeast. This was a hospital that I first visited in 2004. And that evening, we had a meeting with the finance committee about um, whether we keep this hospital open or we close it. They were part of a, of a, of a, of a, a system and, and they were trying to decide whether they close it. Um, in steps, a, 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 a you know, CEO, absolute abundant, one of the most abundant minded CEOs I know of, a great friend of mine, and, um, you know, significant improvement in relations with the medical staff, engaging all staff in improvement. Um, he's, this, this hospital has the highest quality store, scores in the state of Massachusetts, and the hospital was built, the core hospital was built in 1928. It's one of those old TB hospitals on the top of a hill in the town. Um, but you can just see uh, that, that the volume, or excuse me, the revenue growth, the green mar our arrows revenue growth, the red is expense growth, but then, over, then the margin showed up, um, you know, kind of in the blue line. You know, any critical access hospital that's driving this type of, of operating margin is, is doing something right. The second uh, this was a critical access hospital we visited in the upper Midwest back a couple of years ago. And again, very abundance-minded CEO with significant measurement. They had adopted some of the Studer uh, LEMS, um, engaging managers, set tar targets for all managers, um, you know, quarterly meetings to review um, uh, you know, targets. But again, you can look and see the, red, the, the green line is revenue for this hospital. The red line is operating expense. And as services grew, you can see right when the CEO came in back in 2012, revenue started separating from um, expenses as, 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 as the CEO's influence uh, took over the organization and operating margin just absolutely through the roof. Um, so I, you know, here, here's um, you know, just the quality scores. Again, you know, measurement culture and abundance mindset um, the entire, you know, significant focus was on improving quality care for the patients. At the time, this hospital was a five-star and one of the top hospitals in the state, in this in the upper Midwest state. Um, priority areas, um, you know, quality, quality uh, council meets quarterly, um, uh, Studer group engaged, um, the, the, leader, the, the leader evaluation, the LEM was implemented. 10 goals in place for department managers and leadership. 
holding managers accountable for delivering on these LEMs. Uh, the department managers were involved in operational financial management. They were involved uh, in both revenue and expense. Um, um, they they then, then monthly financial statements, required variance analysis. Each manager had four to six goals. Um, that then, then they had an incentive where managers achieving goals would receive, you know, kind of this merit incentive pay. Again, you think of that three-legged stool of decision rights, pushing decisions down, uh, measurement, and, and compensation. These guys nailed that. Uh, another case study we have here is, is um, um, you know, kind of, uh, this was a, a critical access hospital I visited, gosh, um, a couple years back. Um, and, uh, wait, 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 hold on, let me, let me just make sure I have this one right. Yeah, I get my case studies mixed up. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so this was a critical access hospital that, that the, uh, the, the blue is your revenue. The expenses are, are, are the red. Obviously when expenses are above, uh, revenue, that's, you know, that's not a good thing. Even for us non-accountants, that's not a good thing. And you could see what happened. Um, the, the, the orange line was operating margin. Because this hospital had done a recent replace, you know, replaced their clinical units, uh, the number I like to pay attention to is EBITDA less debt service. Um, because critical access hospitals are, are essentially rewarded for depreciation and, and drives revenue. So, but you can see that this hospital was on a declining performance perspective. Revenues were down, expenses were up. In 2018, they you know, early in 2018, they replaced the CEO. They brought in a CEO that I, I consider again one of the top abundance um, um, uh, folks that that I, I know of. I was just at his strategic planning retreat in February. Um, unbelievable! They they are creating a ten. You know, Opal talked about a five year uh, recruitment plan for medical staff. These folks had a ten year recruitment plan, so which puts you in the high schools. For a recruitment perspective, and and um, but you can see here they went from minus ten point six percent, came up, and then the pandemic hit, obviously. And this is only looking at operating margins. This doesn't include any of the COVID funding. Um, but once the COVID, uh, you know, kind of came back up, you can just see you can just see revenue to the point where in fiscal year twenty twenty two, the revenue now is up to the net. The net revenue is seventy three million dollars, up from fifty two million dollars a 16.1% EBITDA less debt service and an 8.7% positive operating margin. Absolutely extraordinary performance. Um, I will share with you that this CEO, um, uh, some, uh, some folks came after, um, uh, 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 you know, took uh, essentially uh, asked for his resignation. Within two weeks, the medical staff reinstate, you know, kind of got the board, met that met with the board and reinstated this um, gentleman, and they're off to the to, to the races. So, but department managers provided profit and loss. It's shared. Department managers engaged in revenue and expense. Incredible effort with the medical staff. The entire medical staff stood up and and supported uh, this CEO. And um, uh, you know, really special, special, special case. Uh, another another case. This was uh, down in the in the in the southeast. A, a critical access hospital had a very scarcity based leadership team, and you could see their performance. Um, right, um, the expenses above revenue. Um, here's your revenue line, the blue. The expenses are above revenue, um, and then in 2021, uh, they replaced that management team with the a CEO who was formerly the COO, but when they brought the new management team, they essentially demoted uh, this, this CEO to a, um, a foundation position. Well, they replaced, they, they brought her back in, put her in CEO, and look what happened to the financial performance. Revenue went through the roof. They ended up getting a Da Vinci um, 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 and, and uh, you know, engaged the orthopedic group, uh, pr recruited primary care, um, and 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 look what happened to revenue uh, skyrocketing uh, to the point where the board was just shocked because they were led to believe by the prior management team that a critical access hospital in this community could not be successful. Um, wrong again, <laughs> and and so. Uh, 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 last one. Uh, this is just another example of a CEO um, in the north northwest that um, 
he, again, let me point out the lines, revenue, um, expense. Uh, this, is, this is an organization that's passionate about uh, providing high quality sick care, but in the parking lot of their critical access hospital, they built a three-story wellness center with a, um, with a you know, total fitness center, gym. They have a climbing, a three-story climbing wall in there. They negotiated a contract with Medicaid to get enhanced um, upfront per member per month payments in their primary care practices. And you can just see the operating revenue in this, in this critical access hospital. Absolutely abundance. Again, one of the most abundant folks I've met. Um, completely committed to both the health and providing high quality sick care in their community. So, you know, I, I look at then again, I, I just want to uh, close out by saying, after all of my travels, and, and at some point, um, <laughs> you guys are going to want me to stop visiting you. Um, but um, I just I distilled down into the, the improvement, you know, these these incredible turnaround stories is three key attributes an abundance mindset a basic economic understanding, recognizing variable costs are not gonna be measured anywhere in your financial statements. You have to make assumptions for them, but contribution margin is critical. And then an organizational design that promotes accountability through effective measurement, the th three keys to this, the kingdoms. So um, with that, um, I don't see any questions, which is great. <laughs> Sorry, but um, because I'm two minutes over and my uh, colleague, Brian Hoppala, who, who um, heads up our Stroudwater Capital Partners has joined us from Hawaii where he's participating in a conference. Aloha, Brian. And, Aloha, Eric. <laughs> but um, I just wanna say, um, Brian uh, joined um, Stroudwater and became a colleague of mine 25 and a half years ago. And I have the highest degree of respect for him and um, what he's doing now with uh, Strawwater Capital Partners, providing access to capital for rural hospitals. Absolutely extraordinary. So with that, I'm going to turn off and be quiet and turn the reins over to Mr. Hoppala. Brian? Aloha, Eric. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks for your comments. Um, over the last 25 years, we've had so many of those experiences together. And it's fun to be able to see some of the projects that we've been able to finance as your case studies. Um, the best practices, because one of the things that we've really learned over the last 25 years, certainly that I have, is how constrained many of our facilities are in areas where we have the most opportunities for growth. Outpatient services, um, you know, not always, per your examples, not always a facility question or issue, uh, which is why I think that these two presentations work really well together. But often we just don't have the space to provide modern healthcare within. Uh, you know, our old Hilburton facilities. So to be able to take this, and for me, you know, over the last 25 years, having about one and a half billion dollars worth of projects under you know, my belt and experience, I just really feel compelled and inspired to be able to share some of these best practices, particularly in how challenging it is to get started or, you know, said differently, kind of get this idea of getting past stop. And the thing that I would say, Eric, that I know that you've also experienced so many times is when we started doing consulting work with facilities back, the first critical access hospital was replaced in 2001, uh, Rio Grande uh, in Del Norte, Colorado. Uh, you know, there was not a good map forward as it relates to how a rural healthcare facility can source capital. There was a lot of uncertainty around, you know, are these organizations sustainable? The critical access hospital program itself was very new. And we see, you know, regularly at that time, uh, as we were working with other organizations, how many starts and stops there were around facilities planning, um, going into an organization and you know, sitting down with the departmental staff in the way that you just talked about and engaging them in what their needs and wants are and how they could better serve their community, how they could enhance those services. There was this feeling of almost you know people being defeated because they had been through this exercise three, four, five times before. Nothing ever happened as a result of it. So it was kind of like, why are we even getting excited? Why are we thinking about what our facilities might be able to look like? We know this isn't going to go anywhere. So now fast forward, um, you know, twenty years later, and being able to bring through Stroudwater Capital Partners 
that level of service to communities so that we are planning with a committed source of capital in mind. We know what those best practices look like and that we wanted to make sure as Redwater Capital Partners that we had what you might think of as skin in the game so that our success is connected to your success. That means if there's no project that gets financed, um, there's no fees that are owed to us. So you know, if we're going to have a business like that and be able to provide that level of service, one of the things that's really important is going back to reflecting on what are those best practices and what is, you know, the real roadmap for success. Now, this is not going to be everything that we're presenting today. Um, the next 30 minutes is really going to be focused down in the lower right hand corner of what we call base camp. Um, you know, step number one, how do we know that we're ready? How do we make sure that before we get people in the organization excited about a potential that we have a, a way to be able to execute on that potential? But it is important, I think, for folks to be able to understand how the pieces tie together and how we really want to be able to guide an organization through these various planning steps to be able to secure financing at the end of the day and how they build on each other. Um, one of the most common questions we get is, you know, where do you really start? And Eric, I think that your comments were so powerful in the sense of, you know, we have an organization that wants to, you know, be involved with population health. We, we you know, want to be able to grow revenues in outpatient areas. So understanding what the goals of the project are and making sure that there is a clear community need identified in support of that. This isn't somebody's pet project. And it's also not a project where we're trying to, for example, um, not a client of ours, but we've seen in the past where people have planned around how do we maximize the impact of our capital investment for cost reporting purposes, for example. That is the tail wagging the dog, as Eric, you've said many times from a cost report perspective. And being able to take a step back from that and say, you know, we're investing in areas where we know that there's a community need and we are in lack currently as it relates to being able to provide that type of service um, you know that's the first place to begin to make sure that our project is oriented towards not just um, you know what we what our medical staff may want to do to go back to some of Opal's comments and it is also connected to where's the industry heading and can we really justify that there's a community need in support of that uh, the next step is really to make sure that you, we get people on the same page and Later in my uh, presentation, uh, we'll talk about the typical project team that we assemble um, to help organize this, but folks need a checklist, we need a roadmap, we need to be able to have a very clear project plan about you know, who is gonna be doing what and by when, and have accountability within the team for a lot of information exchange. Uh, if you've been following the news at all, you know that we've been in a very dynamic environment. Um, that's the understatement of the day around interest rates and um, construction costs, inflation. So, you know, all of those changes require really very timely communication between the folks that are doing the planning, the folks that are doing the cost estimating of what that plan would take to execute. And then, of course, the Eric Shells of the world that are looking at this from the accounting and beam accounting perspective to make sure that we have a, a plan and a, and a study and a business plan and support of being able to, to provide you know, over the long term you know, the sustainability of the project. So then the, the third area is making sure, as I was just referencing, that these uh, project team members are all really coordinating with each other um, you know, through the different stages of planning. Uh, there's a lot of handoffs and certainly there are times when part of the team is a lot more involved than other parts of the team, but having people stay together with, uh, with the, the work that's happening. And again, coming back to that analogy introduced before of climbing a financing mountain. Um, it is a, it's a track and it's a journey and we have, Today, we want to make sure that we're prepared to take on that journey. So the first thing that we do really is this idea of a readiness assessment and look at some key organizational questions to make sure that there is this source of capital that is committed and uh, available to support the project. And 
depending on some variables in your organization and in your community, that source of capital may change a little bit. Um, we, we use the USDA community facilities programs for a lot of the financing. It over the last 25 years has really become the primary source, the most affordable source and the most reliable source of, uh, of capital for rural healthcare projects. And um, in order to be eligible for those programs, uh, the organizations need to be not-for-profit or you know, public pseudo-governmental organizations, district hospitals. Um, for those that are in affiliations with larger healthcare systems, uh, there are some additional considerations around what the role of that healthcare system's own financials may be as it relates to guaranteeing the debt, which is not something that a lot of healthcare systems want to do, um, or uh, being able to support the project in ways through provider recruitment. Again, going back to some of Opal's uh, presentation and the case study from um, earlier uh, in our conference today. Uh, the location of your project and specifically uh, you know, where the project's going to be uh, built does dictate some of the availability of capital, particularly USDA has a delineation at 20,000 people. So if you are in a community of 20,000 people or fewer, you can access really all of USDA's programs um, and be able to um, have what's called the direct loan program, as well as a guaranteed loan, um, and depending on how that state wants to put your put your plan of finance together. Um, and that's a, you know, a very key determining factor, of course, uh, to look at affordability and what you're actually going to be paying over the life of your loan for the servicing of that debt. Um, as I referenced previously, project goals are a really important consideration so that there is a strong uh, planning basis that supports the execution of the project. Um, there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen, you might say, on uh, looking at a financing project. Uh, in the USDA itself, there are multiple levels of approval, uh, starting at the local level. At the state level, there are regional asset risk managers that look at the projects. And you know, really what happens is all of these folks need to be able to wrap their arms around what you're trying to accomplish and how that's going to show up in terms of increased volumes, financial projections, et cetera. Um, so that's a really important basis, again, to have regrounded, but I won't continue to belabor that point. And then the last here is really understanding what is your financial capacity? And that's really where the rest, the majority of the rest of my comments this morning uh, will be focused is how do we look at financial capacity, how do you start to think about debt capacity, what you can afford, what is sustainable, you know, how do we connect that to the changes that are happening in the marketplace right now from an interest rate perspective. Um, there has been a, an increase in interest rates from uh, private lenders as a result of some of the disruptions that have happened in this year with banks closing, et cetera. But the good news is, is that the USDA program itself as a lender Again, they're providing the majority of the money. They are well-funded. They have about $3.5 billion annually to allocate. So they're very well-funded and their interest rates have not seen the same rises that we've seen in the public markets. And in fact, today, if you've seen the news, um, the Fed has even decided to keep interest rates flat. So we're seeing some of this moderating, uh, but we need to understand what's sustainable. At the end of the day, what we're trying to make sure is that we're not following the idea that somehow hope is a strategy, which is where a lot of projects hit stop. You know, we hope that we can do a facility project, but we don't necessarily know what the best practices are and how to put the pieces together in a, in a reliable way that tells our story that is a compelling um, case study, so to speak, uh, for all of the folks that need to take a look at the project. So the place to start in terms of this idea of what can you afford is what we would call conceptual debt capacity. It's a very consulting oriented term, but it's important to understand there, this is not written in stone. There's a lot of assumptions and variables that go into this, but we need a place to start because without a place to start, we could run off into the wrong direction, you know, get on the wrong path to go up the mountain. And then, you know, after, trekking for a while, realized that 
you know, this is not a project that we can continue forward with. So the way that I would encourage you to think about debt, debt capacity is looking at your trend analysis, very quantitative analysis, very similar, Eric, to what you just presented uh, a bit ago in terms of the case studies. You know, none of your slides on case studies was, hey, here's what's happened last year. Aren't we great? Or, you know, draw your conclusion. So being able to think of what's been happening over at least the last five-year period, um, that is not an arbitrary distinction. That's actually within the USDA's funding regulations to look at the past five years of performance. And more specifically, um, to eliminate the effects that might be you know, relative to existing debt with interest payments or prior facility investments with higher depreciation, to really look at this analysis on a cash flow basis or uh, an EBITDA basis uh, as an approximate of cash flow uh, to evaluate what are the resources we think are going to be available for us in the future, given our past performance, not even thinking necessarily about the impact of the project itself yet. So given our past performance, what could we afford to do in the future if we're able to maintain that and then what we're able to do with the project and the increased volumes, we can consider that all upside, all gravy, so to speak. The second consideration, of course, it's important in looking at debt capacity for critical access hospitals, like everybody on the, on the call here today, is that cost-based reimbursement component. Again, Eric, you referenced this with depreciation incentive. Um, you know, there, it's a non-cash item on our on our income statement, but we do end up getting revenue as it relates to the pass through and the cost report. And that really does help make the numbers work for a lot of critical access hospitals. Um, so that is an important aspect of the program. And we want to be able to factor that in. There's not risk associated with that because it's formulaic. Um, again, we could speculate as to a changing payer mix in the future and assume that you know uh, Medicare mix is increasing for certain service lines, which would improve that pass through. But even before we get to any of that kind of speculative math, let's just start with what's our historical cost-based mix been overall, um, you know, looking at our cost report and being able to say, if that's 30%, if that's 40%, then let's factor that into our conceptual debt capacity as our starting point so that we're not being overly conservative around what we can afford and then being overly conservative in an environment where space may cost a thousand dollars per square foot to develop means you might feel like you know we just can't afford to do anything so the cost-based reimbursement component really does help make sure that that is realistic and grounded the third major factor in determining the debt capacity is the ability to look at what, how your cash flow relates to what you're, what you're planning to borrow, how much you're planning to borrow, what the rates in terms of that would be. Uh, we call that your debt service payments, your annual debt service payments. So the debt service coverage ratio then is really the relationship between your cash flow on an annual basis and the cash outflow for your debt service. Uh, a ratio of 1.1 is within USDA's regulations is supportable, um, but it is it might be too too tight for your own comfort because essentially what that is saying is across the entire organization you're generating a dime over and above the the dollar that you need to spend for debt service and that's a pretty thin margin for all of your other organizational needs for operating purposes. Um, we tend to see projects at 1.25, so at least getting 25% over and above that or more. Uh, we've had some projects, and the one, Eric, that you referenced with the wellness center, um, they had a, a two times coverage ratio. So they were able to generate uh, historically and then through their project, it even enhanced it further, as they're shown on your slide, an ability to double their debt, even on a, you know, 35, $40 million project, which is a substantial amount of debt to be taking on, uh, they were able to generate that and more in cash flow in the ways that you had described in your case study. Uh, of course, the other thing that we want to be mindful of is keeping enough powder dry, not putting all of our eggs into the basket of a, of a new project and having cash on hand that is 
uh, suitable for us to be able to maintain operations. Uh, typically, again, there's no specific uh, required range, but we look at 40 to 50 days, I would say, as a you know, safe starting point. Anything above that is obviously beneficial, but understanding that we want to be able to maintain some liquidity for other types of capital needs, regular routine capital purchases, and certainly recruitment efforts and the types of other things that we've talked about this morning already. Now, the next challenge really is to kind of think about how do we take our debt capacity and start to translate that into what does that really mean for a, from a project perspective? And the very first step of that is to take the debt capacity on the right-hand side of this slide here, the column, uh, and within the USDA, the direct loan amount or the guaranteed loan amount, the combined version of what you can afford there and say, you know, are there excess reserves that we can also add to our project? Um, is there a funded depreciation account that we've been um, you know, putting money away over a period of time to support uh, capital investment? Or is there fundraising that we can do um, that can you know, be another source of resource to help us put together a project that's gonna meet the community's needs? Um, going back to this small community in Del Norte, Colorado, the first replacement critical access hospital at the time, they had, I think, five days of cash on hand uh, and really looked at a community of a couple thousand people and said, you know, we're not sure what we're going to be able to raise from this community in terms of fundraising. So we're going to be very conservative and we're going to say that we can raise somewhere between $500,000 and a million dollars. As it turned out, once that organization and they demonstrated to the community that this was a viable plan, the community got really excited about it. And they ended up raising $5 million, which was very much, of course, beneficial when they were operating at such tight margins at the time and you know, did not have a lot of that uh, excess liquidity. Now, fast forward 25 years later, this same organization has grown several fold. They've uh, I think they're now a 30 to $40 million net revenue organization up from about six to $7 million 25 years ago. And they have a, a operating reserve account of over $20 million. So they've been able to prove with some additional investments through that period of time that the idea, Eric, that you shared before of you know, how we're able to connect and grow revenue and keep people in our community from bypassing us for services that we can safely perform locally, how important that is. So we need to, we know we need to have a sustainable equity contribution uh, and amount, but we haven't necessarily yet answered, how do we know what that means from a budget perspective? So here is the principle that I would give you is being able to start with kind of an allowance. Once you've looked at what you think your sources of revenue are, how do we create an allowance for the construction amount? And the, the, the metric that I would offer to you is once you've determined your debt capacity and then projected how much additional equity you might want to add to the project from those variety of sources, 75% of that is roughly what you can be putting towards construction costs. The other 25% is going to go towards uh, planning fees, engineering fees, and a lot of other things. So don't plan on spending that on your construction. Use 75% as your starting point for, from a planning perspective, which then kind of leads directly into one of my very last points here, which is coming back to that idea of the project team and how do we get everybody on the same page? Who needs to be at the table? Um, and how do we make sure that they're working off of uh, off the same plan? And Having a clear budget in place is a great place to start. Um, really understanding that the project team involves a variety of different perspectives. You see them listed here. Uh, at, from the hospital, we typically have both the CEO and the CFO uh, participating in regular meetings. We do a project plan that's an online project management system so everybody can kind of see what's going on with, with the financing process and where we are in that process. And then we do regular weekly coordination calls and check-ins so that people are sharing information and their progress, holding each other accountable. Um, we, we need to have the hospital folks there. We need to have the financial feasibility um, as previously referenced. Uh, we need to look at meeting environmental requirements for USDA. 
Obviously the architectural uh, engineering and design team um, is there. Uh, typically there are specific um, advocates of the project that are familiar with construction uh, that are on your team as a hospital that kind of are a liaison in many cases between you and the architectural and design team. Uh, we call those owner's representatives. Um, they're, they're again, representing you as an owner and making sure that um, all of the pieces that are being presented to you are in line with industry standards and are reasonable. Um, so let's kind of take a step back and look at how this ties then back into our overall plan, which is we have a readiness assessment. We checked some of those boxes. We have a plan of finance. We know kind of what we're going to be uh, able to afford. Um, this is down in the base camp area. The very next thing that we're going to do um, is make sure that we have an understanding of how these pieces are tied back to those community needs. Um, the USDA requirement for an application, they call this a preliminary architectural report. It's a specific document that, that um, lays all of this information out. Um, the next requirement in the USDA financing process is making sure that the site meets environmental regulations. Uh, USDA is very particular about that because of, they have to be through the regulations. Uh, we need to make sure that there's uh, the due diligence on the financial feasibility side uh, as the third requirement, and then that there's an appraisal to make sure that the value of the project is less than is equal to or greater than the amount of money that you're going to be um, borrowing. Uh, we submit the application, we go through the kind of documentation process, a lot of back and forth with USDA to answer their questions that they're doing their due diligence and kind of walk up the financing mountain together. And with that, I'll just see if there are any questions as we kind of did all of that pretty quickly. And I think we're a couple minutes over. Any questions? I don't know if I can see them here. Ryan, you've actually got a couple minutes, so you're you're okay if, if you. Oh, need. thanks, Jeff. All right, yeah. So, um, what I'll just say in summary is, I really think that it's important from a um, <clears throat> starting out perspective, the readiness perspective, to not get ahead of where we are from a financial capacity um, point of view, and the the projects themselves create benefit as referenced by the case studies and some of the stories that you've heard today. But the most conservative thing that we can do is really look back at this, those historical financials and work within those constraints to, to the extent that we can. So that would be my, my takeaway advice, I would say, is let's make sure that we are creating a realistic planning foundation for what is being planned for the future and that we're able to, to partner with and bring along our boards of directors who themselves you know, will not be familiar with taking on a $20, $30 million capital project if it's a substantial project and have not had, you haven't, most of, the, of our critical access hospital clients have not had a lot of debt on their books historically. And the idea of taking that on can feel precarious and risky because you know, those are the types of things that have, uh, been blown up in folks' minds around, you know, we're taking on a lot of additional risk because we have this huge investment and we need to be able to see the return. And to the point of when we're planning on how we've been able to be successful in the past, that risk of the project creating some kind of detrimental impact in the future is much less so, I would say. So with that, Jeff, I think that it's going to be time for me to wrap up. I, again, I can't really see if we have any questions here, but to um, to just turn it over to you and uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing about how you uh, and the team are thinking about strategic risk assessments. Well, thank you, uh, Brian. Always um, an education and enlightening to hear about um, how you're helping folks access capital. So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm joined with this presentation with my colleague, Claire Kelly. Um, and we're delighted to be able to spend some time with you talking about strategic risk and how strategic risk analysis is really a uh, essential and foundational uh, component uh, for uh, leadership teams and boards, uh, given the dynamic healthcare environment where 
we're currently in. Um, I think most of you are at this point familiar with Stroudwater. What I will say is um, one of the hats that uh, Claire wears as, as part of her work with us is in our affiliate on our affiliations team, helping organizations identify partnership, um, the right partnership structure, and whether, frankly, a partnership is is the right course of action for them. I'm also involved in that work. And so with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Claire. Uh, Claire, take it away. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. So one of the first things I want to talk about today are industry factors that are impacting risks to organizations like critical access hospitals. So we know that a lot of hospital closures are happening, especially in the rural environment, but what else is going on in the market and what's contributing to those closures? So one of the first things we look at are the three most significant rating agencies in the world, and that's Moody's, Fitch, and Standard & Poor's, or S&P, and they produce a not-for-profit healthcare outlook um, two times a year. And so in December of 2022, they produced one for 2023, and they said that, and all three of them said that there's deteriorating or a negative outlook for not-for-profit healthcare. And so what's driving that is, you know, you've got your labor shortages, you've got your supply chain disruptions, you have persistent COVID-19 surges, and that's all increasing expenses where you're having some flat revenue growth or revenue growth is not going at the same rate that those expenses are increasing. So that's what contrib that, that is what is contributing to that deteriorating or negative outlook. I will say in a month or two, they will have their mid-year outlook and that will become revised and those may change, but it's highly likely that they'll remain at this uh, deteriorating or negative outlook. One of the other things we want to look at is the number of affiliations that have taken place over the past 15 years or so. So in this table here, you'll see from 2005 to 2020, the number of hospital affiliations that have occurred. And you can see that in the past decade or so, there's an abnormally high amount that more and more hospitals are affiliating. Now, frankly, we could have a whole hour webinar on the different catalysts and reasons behind why those hospitals are affiliating. But just to touch on a few today, one is margin pressures. So again, where you have your expenses that are really outpacing your revenues, you have staffing crises and provider shortages, which I'm sure some of you on this call are feeling. And it's not just your MDs and your nurse practitioners and your physician's assistants, it's your RNs, it's your facility staff, it's your front desk staff, those folks are hard to get as well. And you also have economies of skill. And what we mean by that is a knowledge of what's going on in the rural market. The rural market is very complex. There's a lot of minutia. There's a lot of, um, frankly, education and skill that needs to go into being able to navigate that environment to maximize the reimbursement that you're getting in a lot of ways, to maximize the volume and revenue generation that you can get. So those are all, you know, just a couple high level factors that are really influencing what's driving these affiliations of partnerships. One of the other things we want to talk about, this is a favorite saying of ours at Stroudwater, and it's time is never a neutral factor. And what we really mean by that is that time is important to be efficient with. You have to be very efficient with your time. You have to be efficient with your decision making. So if you and your board and your leadership are debating doing a performance improvement process or debating going out and looking for a partner, being efficient with evaluating an appropriate analysis, education, figuring out, okay, is this the right move for us is critical and saying, okay, it's time to make the decision. Is it go or no go? The more you waffle, the more you move back and forth and debate and don't have everyone in the same boat rowing in the same direction, the more susceptible you are to what we call major developments in the market. That's your COVID-19s that pop up. That's the lawsuits that pop up. We actually had a client that was in the middle of a transaction and had a lawsuit occur because they weren't necessarily being as efficient with their time as they could have been. So it's preventing and shortening that time frame that you are vulnerable to major developments happening in the market. And finally, it's really important as a board, as leadership, as medical staff to understand that no matter what option you pick, whether that's to remain independent, whether that's to pursue volume growth, whether that's to pursue a potential partnership, 
those all come with inherent risks. There is no risk-free option that's on the table. You're going to have operating risk if you choose to remain independent, and you're going to have partnership risk if you choose to go that route and find and affiliate with a partner, no matter what type of partnership or affiliation structure you choose, whether that's a full-on asset merger or just a clinical affiliation those all come with inherent risks. There is no risk-free option on the table. So it's about evaluating what is the best option for you and what is the best and most efficient way you can mitigate those risks that are on the table. So when I say risk, what am I meaning? What, what is risk? How can we understand risk? So we would label the risk of an organization based on how stressed that organization is. So on this chart in front of me, we have distressed all the way to the left, and we move kind of up this continuum to stable. And so on a very high level, again, this is different for each organization, and there's a lot of analysis that goes into figuring out where each of these organizations would lie on this continuum. But from a high level, a distressed organization would be one that has three plus years of decline in negative margins. They don't have the funds to really reinvest in their asset base, meaning, you know, do the needed capital needs improvement or the needed equipment. Your cost cutting measures are really impacting your core programs and not just services your community needs, but the core programs that are really keeping your hospital afloat. So this is an organization that's at risk of closure and is really just trying to keep the doors open. If we're looking at an organization that we call stressed, you'd have two or so years of declining margins. You'd have reductions in needed services, not your core services, but services your community needs and that you'd like to still provide. Um, you'd have deteriorating quality and potentially HCAP scores. Um, and you would start to see where those expenses are really outpacing revenue and you're starting to head towards that distressed side of the spectrum. When we look at a stable organization, which is all the way to the right on this chart, what we see here is consistent margins. You have the funds to reinvest in your asset base and not only reinvest, but grow your asset base. You have the ability to increase top line revenue and grow service lines and make choices about who you partner with or if you want to partner and be able to say no to a partnership. Or if you're doing a performance improvement project, it's to expand on your already you know, needed and core services that you have in the community. <clears throat> so when we say distressed and stressed hospitals, it's important to really, if you're at that point, look at the benefits of a partnership or a performance improvement initiative or both, because you need to find ways to to slow down or mitigate that deterioration and keep going towards the left on our, on our continuum here, we need to figure out ways and methods that can help your organization become more stable. So why is understanding the stress of your organization important? And how does that relate to risk? So if an organization does not understand its long-term risk trend, and that's you've been evaluating your risk trend annually, and you're looking at it year over year to understand the compound effects that that annual year over year is having, you can endanger your organization to not understand how sustainable you can be, your, what you can do with your available resources, and frankly, you're putting your relationships at risk because you don't know where your organization is headed. So if you are a distressed organization, we put you as high risk and being a high risk organization really impacts what you can do. So in terms of partnerships, no health system out there really, no matter the size, really wants to partner with a hospital that's about to close. And the few that do mainly partnership for parts. So you may go in as a hospital, but come out just a freestanding ED. So there aren't a lot of great scenarios where you have leverage in that or negotiation power when you're in that partnership. And when performance improvement initiatives, again, getting back to our old friend time, performance improvement initiatives take time. We've had um, folks call and say, I don't know if I can make payroll in two weeks. What can I do to, you know, turn my system around? Well, at that point, there's not a lot you can do that's on the table. Performance improvement does take time. It takes time to turn that around. It's hard to have needed cash in two weeks with that time frame. When we look at stressed organizations or what we label as medium risks, from that position, you know, if you need to partner the longer you wait and the more stressed you become as an organization, the less leverage you have in a partnership, which means 
there's going to be less potential partners at the table. And if you're negotiating or pushing back on some items, it's going to be harder and harder to push back on items that you don't agree with. Because again, you're becoming a more stressed organization. It's going to make it more difficult. If in terms of performance improvement initiatives, for stressed organizations, it's really critical that they're able to slow that deterioration. Um, it may not be able to stop it completely, but implementing those performance improvement initiatives is critical at this stage because they do take time. They do take time to show the turnaround effects. For a low risk, and what we'll say low risk is not all the way to the right, but almost to all the way to that stable, stable um, option on the right. So we call them slight stress. For this, when you're an organization that's low risk, you have full negotiating power and leverage when it comes to talking with a partner. You have the ability to say no if you don't like the terms that are laid out on the table. You have the ability to say, we're going to go to someone else. And you have a greater ability to say, what kind of partnership do we want? Do we just want a clinical partnership? Do we want a full-on asset merger or sole member substitution? You have for more power and ability to make those decisions. And when it comes to performance improvement, you have the ability to grow services. You have the ability to grow different service lines. You have the ability and bandwidth to focus specifically on um, certain departments if you want to and say, okay, this department is more stressed than the rest of our hospital. We can devote time and expertise to this department to turn it around. So it's coming at it from a different angle. So what are some factors that are really gonna impact your risk. So the way Stroudwater looks at a strategic risk profile is through four different domains. And those are financial risk, operating risk, value risk, and market risk. And there are factors within each of those domains. It's important to understand that no domain is in a silo. So all of these factors have spillover effects into the different domains. So for example, um, your quality, the quality of services that you're providing at an organization, that's going to impact your volume of people that you're going to get in the door because they hear your high quality, which will impact your market share, which impacts your revenue and cash flow. These all are integrated together. It's important to understand and it's important for boards and leadership to understand that not evaluating these factors on an annual basis, but looking at them long-term will help you understand the risk of your organization. If you look at it on a year-by-year -year basis, it might not look like much. They might be incremental changes and you go, okay, but we have bigger fish to fry. Like, why, why are we focusing on this? But when you see the cumulative effects laid out and what's happening long-term for your organization, those can be far more drastic than one suspects. And with that, turn it over to Jeff. And Jeff, you might want to tilt your camera up a little bit. Thank you. Um, appreciate that, Claire. Um, with that in mind, what I wanted to do, um, Claire, if you can advance the slide, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, is just take a moment to think about the, the, the relevance of strategic risk to every organization. And it really is about um, to what degree is the organization's mission potentially compromised or compromised in the future. And um, what Claire and I have tried to do with, with the clients we've worked with using this methodology and framework is help them appreciate um, to what degree their ability to sustain and continue their mission might be at risk. This uh, slide in the white text uh, includes various methodologies or approaches that can help mitigate uh, uh, some of those risk factors within each of those domains. So looking at the financial risk domain initially, certainly understanding gaps in performance is essential. Uh, one of the things that Claire and I do is look at long-term uh, financial performance and put it within a strategic framework to understand how close to a sustainable threshold is that long-term financial performance to identify gaps. Um, for an organization that is really more than stressed, but distressed, uh, that's where looking at the cash run rate becomes critical. Like how close are you to running out of cash and understanding that? One of the things we've seen is a lot of um, organizations were flush um, during COVID because of COVID relief funding, um, but that um, the increased cost uh, structure, staffing, and other inputs has really depleted those cash base, that cash basis. So uh, really critical. The last thing I'll note 
um, is, and Claire touched on this, looking at the long-term trends, not just financial, but operating and market trends and value trends over the long-term is critical because it's very easy to be the proverbial um, frog in the pot of water and not really anticipate or, or experience that temperature increase. But when you look at a five-year or seven-year trend line, you can really understand how the strategic position of the organization has changed and what's driving it. Um, so uh, I would emphasize as well from the point Claire mentioned that many of these indicators are rear view looking. So the importance of looking at them regularly really becomes essential. Um, one of the lesser known uh, risk domains that we talk about here is the value risk domain. And I think it's really critical that folks understand how they're positioned both in terms of quality metrics, but also in terms of cost metrics. So something to really keep your eye on uh, as we think about uh, that. Claire, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so one of the things we often find when we work, not always, but often find when we're working with an organization, especially one that's grappling with significant risk, maybe operations haven't been where they need to be, um, is there can be a significant amount of mistrust within various stakeholder groups. The, the risk of that kind of mistrust or misalignment uh, is amplified when you have kind of shared governance between, it might be a not-for-profit board that operates the facility, but there's a board of a hospital district or county commissioners that owns the hard assets. And so it's very easy to get at cross purposes. Um, but even within an organization that doesn't have that kind of complex governance structure, creating alignment and understanding uh, really starts with education. Um, and then from our perspective, it is about creating a common fact base. So people aren't coming to the discussion with separate sets of facts that might not be uh, correct or might lack context, it's really important to have a common understanding of the situation via a common fact base. Um, some other approaches that can help build trust and mitigate risk um, that, that can result from distrust or dysfunction is to convene a work group or task force with representation across, sta across stakeholders and once you've done that, um, the idea of working towards consensus versus unanimity, we'll touch on that in a moment, but oftentimes it's, it's very achievable to achieve consensus when you can articulate a shared vision for the future. What are the common interests and objectives of those different stakeholders? Often they're much more uh, overlapping and consistent than distrust or dysfunction will have, have you believe. So that shared vision for the future is an important risk mitigation tool. Um, effective communications, um, avoiding leaks and rumor, but also recognizing that it's really important for timely communication with stakeholders uh, and amplifying that shared vision, really, really critical. The last point, I think that Claire and I would both make to leadership is you may have strategic planning, you may have governance issues you're working through, you may decide based upon the risk factors um, that exploring your strategic options and partnering is, is a worthwhile endeavor. It's really important regardless of what direction you go in to not lose sight of the fundamentals and especially operational performance because there is no scenario uh, whether via partnership or standalone strategy, where operational performance can be ignored long term. So that really is essential um, for any organization. Next slide, Claire. I think it's um, also vital to know we've got a very dynamic environment. Um, and regardless of how um, comprehensive your analysis and your approach or process might be, um, there's going to be significant uncertainty. And um, you can't wait for perfect information or unanimity before you decide to act. Um, as, as one of my mentors has shared with me um, 15 or 20 years ago, if, if you wait until everybody sitting around the boardroom agrees uh, on a course of action, you've waited too long. You've burned through time and Claire emphasized how important time is. 
oftentimes you've burned through reserves, uh, which are a scarce commodity, and you, you may have weakened the ability of the organization to pursue its vision and mission going forward. Again, uh, really important to have, have some timely decision-making. Next slide, Claire. So the bottom line, um, we've got a very time challenging environment. You all are aware of that. Um, that long-term risk trend, understanding what the trend, trend is and what is driving it is really important for a management team, for a board, for decision makers. And again, it's, if you lose sight of that uh, and you, you don't, you're not on top of it, uh, it can really erode value, really erode resources and undermine the sustainability of the organization going forward. And, and by sustainability, we're talking about its ability to serve the community, which is, which is critical. Um, so a clear understanding of that risk profile and what's driving it. Um, and that long-term long trend line is extremely important. Um, we think there's value in thinking about the four domain areas of risk. Um, oftentimes financial and operational dominate the discussion, um, but it's really important to get a sense of what's going on in the market. And importantly, as we look at um, new payment models to understand the value of the organization in terms of the, the interplay between quality and cost um, and, and how it's positioned going forward. Absolutely uh, critical. Um, we've also talked about trust and communication and a common fact base in education is really foundational to getting this right. And that's, that's really uh, uh, important. One of the things I would emphasize, um, and this is something we feel very, very strongly about, um, is if you do have an outside advisor working with you, make sure they're agnostic as to the future direction and providing good objective information. Um, if you hire a hammer um, to advise you, they're gonna search for a nail. And you really want somebody who is open-minded and uh, objective about what the organization needs. They're not trying to sell the one product they happen to be expert at or happen to uh, be able to deliver. Um, and as we've stated before, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Don't wait until everybody around the boardroom table or everybody in the task force uh, is in agreement. Consensus is your friend. Unanimity in some instances may be unachievable, um, but really focusing on those operational uh, and performance uh, indicators, the bottom line. Um, next slide, please, Claire. Well, that's the end of our content. We, we do want to open it up for questions. Um, and before we do, I just want to share, you can see there Claire and my email and phone number. Um, so if you do have questions or want to pick up a conversation offline, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, I don't know, do we have any questions, Claire? Do, we have two. So the first, Jeff, is how do you initiate conversations with a board around this subject? Um, I would start with um, one of the things we, we talked about in um, the mitigating risk part of the um, slide deck, which is um, really it's around education, right? Nobody uh, should be resistant to education, education around um, what's going on nationally, uh, what's going on regionally, what's going on in, in the market, um, and really trying to make sure that decision makers, senior leadership, meaning management in the board and medical staff leadership, um, are aligned around some of those key um, factors. Um, and then to the degree that um, um, you know, folks haven't seen it, educating folks as to those long-term trends, looking at five-year or longer trend lines on some of those metrics so that leadership can apprise and evaluate, geez, there has been some really material changes here. Um, but I would certainly start with, with uh, education. And I think I, I would, that's the second step, um, as I was alluding to, is really around that common fact base. If you can do those two things, 
whatever direction you go from there, it will be based upon good information, sound information, and um, you'll be educated in making, making decisions. I agree with that, Jeff. Our next question is, what are low-hanging fruit performance improvement initiatives? I can address this one, and frankly, the answer is it's different for every organization. It's going to be different depending on the different factors that are at play. Off the top of my head, you know, I think cost report is always something that is an option on the table. Revenue cycle, 340B, those are all low-hanging fruit options um, that are you know, something that we would tend to look at first or suggest to look at first typically can have some, you know, financial value that can go into an organization. And um, I think that's that's spot on, Claire. It's, it's highly individualistic. Um, I think one of the things I would point to is something we see as a consistent challenge is hospitals that really struggle to get their provider organization on track. That is all their employed and aligned clinics and providers. And that's a, that's a challenging and different business, um, really shaped profoundly by provider shortages and burnout uh, in today's world. And really um, being able to manage that business effectively really is, a, is a, something we see as kind of a recurring theme. Absolutely. Um, well, I think that's it for today. Just a brief overview there of Stratwater Services and who we are. Um, what we wanted to do was encourage uh, all of our attendees to complete a very quick survey. We really want to know what you thought about today's session, what was helpful, what was not, so we can improve our offerings. Um, and we're excited to hear from you. Uh, and we're also excited that tomorrow is day two of uh, this virtual CA uh, conference. And so we're excited to join you again tomorrow on um, some important topics and um, all learn from each other. So thank you very much. I hope everybody has a restful evening and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.